You're listening to the When Life Hands You Lennon's podcast. But in an entry-level film production, it's one strike and you're out. You're fired. I'm not calling you back. If your goal today is to make a basket, we're going to make that basket. The minute you create something, as soon as it's made tangible, you have a copyright in it. How do I get our guys to sound that big, you know, that full when they do the harmonies? And I'm your host, Lennon Seahawk. Let's get to the show. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to check in with you guys and just see how everybody's doing. And if you're staying safe and healthy and sane, I know the world is a little crazy right now, um, but just stay with it, stick with it, keep doing what you're doing. We're going to persevere and come through this stronger than ever. Um, and just just keep going at it. Stay positive. Uh, help each other, lift each other up. And I, I wanted to check in, what are you guys doing to stay sane? What are you guys doing to keep yourself busy? Are you, are, you keep, are you working still? Are you working on personal projects? Are you writing music? Are you planning up something else? Are you working on a business? What are, what are you all doing to, to stay uh, sane and healthy? Uh, shoot me a message on Instagram and let me know, or tweet me uh, and let me know what you're doing. Uh, to stay sane during this crazy time. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear it because I've gone crazy a couple times, but I have to reel myself right back in and remind myself that there's nothing I can do and to keep going forward, no matter how hard it is, to keep going forward. This week's episode features Mr. Sean Giovanni. Now, he is a sonic storyteller and the owner of The Record Shop, which is a multimedia production company and recording studio based in Nashville, Tennessee. To date, he's worked with artists like Big and Rich, Tim McGraw, Juicy J, Lil John, Zach Wild, and The Wallflowers. He has spoken at numerous events like the NAM Show, Grammy Camp, SAE, Belmont University, MTSU, and a number of other universities. In this episode, Sean and I dig into a plethora of topics, just like all the other po- incredible podcast episodes on the show, but Sean and I dig into great topics like live streaming in the midst of coronavirus. We talk about how you can get set up. He gives a very basic setup and some tools that you can use uh, to get started with live streaming and even some tips and tricks on how to promote a live stream. For example, you don't just want to go live randomly, and he gives an example why. We also talk about content creation because that is a huge part of Sean's job as the owner of The Record Shop. He helps artists and his clients build content, record content, and then use it to promote their live streams, their concerts, whatever it may be. And he helps them create that type of content, which is so important. And we talk about scheduling and when to post, uh, what type of posts. Like, for example, we just had the tragic passing of George Floyd due to uh, the police brutality and all the uproar and protests from that. So we talk about, is it tone deaf to post your own content, promote yourself? We talk about why it's important to take these things into uh, account and the world around you just in general as well, in especially during coronavirus. We also talk about remaining persistent and not giving up because if you have a backup plan, you're going to fall back on it. And that's why we talk about why it's not good to have a backup plan and why you should throw that out the window, set a goal for yourself, and just keep pushing forward until you achieve that goal. And amongst a handful of other things, Sean gives great advice on a, a, a range of topics, including major recording studios and their business models and how he's surviving and uh, all those types of things and what his artists and clients are working on the types of projects that they're able to succeed on during this time. Before we dive into the episode and Sean shares more about himself, uh, I want to remind you to please sign up to the mailing list as it helps me notify you when new episodes are live, just like this. I would also appreciate if you would follow me on Instagram. I post my life on there as well as some good tips and tricks and podcast stuff on there as well. And I would appreciate a five-star review on Apple Podcasts as it greatly helps me grow the show and it be discovered by new listeners. And lastly, if you or somebody you know would be a good guest for the show, 
please fill out the guest request form in the show notes below. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's episode. Let's dive into my conversation with Mr. Sean Giovanni. Uh, where are you based at? I'm based in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And have you, have you always been in Nashville? Uh, no. I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and then I went to school in Minneapolis, and then I moved to Nashville. Oh, cool. Where'd you go to school in Minneapolis at? Uh, I went to a small uh, recording school in uh, downtown Minneapolis. Okay. Yeah, cool. I'm from Minnesota, so it's always fun to see people go to school there. So yeah, why don't you just kind of tell a little bit about you, give us a, give us kind of a good grounding, and we'll kind of branch out from there. Great. Uh, well, I'm a sonic storyteller. I run a production company based in Nashville called The Record Shop. And our goal is to help artists achieve their creative vision uh, through a variety of different types of multimedia production. I mainly handle uh, producing audio and records and, uh, and then managing or project managing the, uh, the ideas around content creation for artists. Great. So I like, I like the sonic storyteller. Can you explain what that means? The way that I look at production is always based in a very visual and experience-based philosophy. When I was young and I first started really falling in love with music, I, I recognized that I enjoyed listening to music, different types of music and different types of experiences in life. If I was playing sports, there's a certain type of energy. Uh, if I'm vibing out with my friends at a party, there's a certain type of you know energy. Uh, if you're just relaxing, you know there, there's a different type of music you might enjoy. And I started to recognize that and why I was sort of drawn to different types of music during different experiences. So when I got to thinking more about how to approach creating an arrangement for a song, um, the instrumentation that would be used in a song, the tempo, the, the key, the general emotion that it falls into, I, I really look at production as a way of telling the artist's story. And uh, many songs are based around some type of story. You know, the lyric is creating some sort of visual element. So how can I use sound to be able to support the lyric in a way that's going to be, be able to help that artist's vision come across? in the right way. And honestly, I got tired of showing up to networking events and parties and people asking me what, what I do and saying, I'm a producer and I own a recording studio and I manage content creation for artists. And I do a little bit of development and we do some sync licensing and, you know, just kind of rambling off the laundry list of, of what your business card would say. Uh, and I wanted to come up with a clear, concise way to tell someone what I do as an occupation, but also what my passion is in one very clear way. Yeah, that that's interesting. Now you you said you do a lot of like content creation, which is a little bit different than what a typical recording studio would do. Uh, what made you get into wanting to do that versus just running a studio? When I got started in the recording industry, uh, it was two thousand six, and I moved to Nashville. I was twenty years old, um, and I quickly found that what my instructors at the school had been telling me for a while, the recording industry was in a very tough time. Uh, commercial studios were having trouble staying open. Record budgets were slashed. Um, there just wasn't the same type of volume and the same type of money that was going into music creation. And the old business model of having a really great facility with really great equipment and really great engineers and then booking that facility for a day rate and that being your revenue stream uh, had become a fairly challenging thing to maintain aside from a very small portion of the, of the major studios that still existed. Uh, I also, because of the way that the industry was, uh, it was very challenging for me to find a job at any one of those studios. And after failing to do so for quite some period of time, I figured out that I was going to probably need to start this, this journey on my own and start to develop my own, uh, my own idea around how you can make a living long term in this, in this new era of the music industry. And one of the things that I recognized as I was starting to get my career going as a freelancer and just going from one session to another and kind of collaborating with artists in different ways, uh, was that that model was really challenging to sustain on an, in a, in a massive scale, um, where you would really be required to just kind of take on everything that came your way because you needed to make sure that you were clocking in all the hours that you could, because that's where your income came from. So I started to think about how could I serve artists in, uh, in a larger way, and also from a business standpoint, how could I create a variety of revenue streams that would help me be able to focus a majority of my energy on to producing records that I was really, really excited about? So I saw that need uh, that artists had, and I saw my personal need for being able to 
figure out a, a unique business model within this market. And I also started to learn that as a producer, we really get in touch with the vision of what the artist is going after, not just for their music, but for the way that they express themselves, their personality, um, their the way that they dress, their their image, uh, which all falls into their brand and their uh, their visual content that they would create. But artists aren't always the best at describing what it is that they want. But if you're a producer, that's the job is to be intuitive about learning about who someone is creatively. You can pick up on those things, and then if you know enough about these different aspects of the industry, be able to vocalize that to the other people that might be brought in with it. So what I did was I didn't try to become a um, halfway decent person at all of these different things. I just focused on producing records, but I built a network of resources around me of experts in videography and website design in SEO in uh, online marketing in uh, promotion in booking. And then when I was working with an artist that needed any one of those things, I could go to a few different people in these different sectors of the industry and then kind of be a liaison for them and be a project coordinator, for lack of a better term, uh, to, to help artists uh, work through those things. And in a lot of content, visual content creation, audio is a necessity. So I was able to support on the audio side of things, but I would rely on a, on a professional to do that. And that was really where it started to stem from, was trying to figure out a way to serve the modern recording artist in a unique way that would not lead me into trying to become a jack of all trades, but just to be able to be an invaluable asset to an artist team. That's so important. And I, I mean, as a journalist and uh, I've been a journalist for a couple of years now, it's the, the branding and the artist story is so, so vital to somebody like me who knows nothing about, who often gets an email pitch, will maybe spend 10, 15 seconds on an email, if that, and it's time to move on. If I don't get and understand your brand and image, I'm going to move on. And like understanding that, and I think it's so important for artists, and it's you clearly do as well, understanding the importance of an artist's brand and an artist's image is so, so important. So especially in today's world where, you know, social media is so quickly evolving and like you could easily post three, four, five times a day and keeping up with that much content is, is really difficult. So can you talk about that and how, how can you, how can an artist keep up with content like that? And how do you create so much content without getting completely overwhelmed with everything? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a challenge. And I think that one of the challenges that I see with artists a lot is that those types of things aren't fun as fun, I guess, as creating the music or performing, because that's what really fulfills them. The whole like self-promotion and the trying to figure out a cool way to show your best life isn't like the net, always the, the natural inclination of an artistic person who's generally fairly introverted and very analytical, uh, 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 you know, in their head, um, observing the world around them. It's a lot of the things that makes us as creatives, you know, unique and and what, why, how our minds work. So the idea of like throwing it out there and then trying to figure out these creative things to say without sounding cliche, without just trying to like, quote unquote, like sell yourself, but without selling yourself, you know, it can become really overwhelming. So uh, I've had a lot of experience with that, trying to guide artists through that, through that process, because as I understand their personalities, I know the things that sort of make them tick and the things that can, um, can be challenging for them. So the first thing is to figure out how you can make the content as creative as how you make the creation of your art or as fun as getting on stage. And I think that that just has to do with perspective. When we change how we consider something, then the experience could be a little bit different. So uh, let's take just like the content creation as a whole. Well, I talk with artists and, and I say, let's come up with some things like we just talk about, like, what excites you? What do you do outside of music? What are the types of like books you like to read, the movies you watch? What do you do with your friends when, you, when you're not in the middle of your music? What are the experiences that you're ha- having? Um, well, why don't we come up with some content around those experiences and, and, uh, and share that with your fans as opposed to you feeling like every single post has to be about your music and your new song and come to my show and buy my CD and uh, uh, not buy my CD, uh, uh, stream my song. Um, you know, those, those, those things, um, are just in generally in the social media side of things are the things that don't really work until you have that trust base and that relationship. So as you mentioned, the most important thing is the artist telling their story. And then secondarily, the artist sharing their lifestyle and creating like a culture around their music. 
So that's what I dive in with them is to, to make it a little bit easier. Let's look at this as another way of expressing ourselves. What are the other things that, you know, that we're passionate about? Um, so I have an artist right now that, um, that I'm working with. Um, her name's Leah. Uh, she's an incredible alternative singer songwriter with some really great jazz influence. Um, and, uh, I think she describes it as like jazz R and B, uh, you know, pop. And we're working on figuring out like the one cohesive way to say who she is as an artist. But as we're working through her, um, her content creation, um, she came up with this idea to take, um, show tunes, um, because she's a big fan of that, of, the, of those types of songs and then do her own rendition of those songs in a jazzy pop version. And, uh, and so she had, that's one of the types of content that she puts together. Um, so that has to do with her music still, but it's in a different side of it. And it's not necessarily her just trying to like self-promote her own, you know, original stuff. And it's also not just the straight up cover of something. So it's like interesting. Um, and it's, uh, you know, different, different sort of thing. Uh, another thing that, that we've done is, um, taken, uh, she has this idea like little quotes with little Leah. So there's this little cartoon of her that she created. And then she has these little uh, quotes that she found in these little diaries that she had when she was a kid and then like repurposes them and shares them and her thoughts and, and, and ideas with people. And that's another like concept of, uh, you know, of content. And so that stuff can be fun and creative in doing that. Now, the hard thing, like you said, is like we have to have all of this content and all of these different platforms on a consistent basis. So how do we continue to do that? I try to break it down to be a little bit more manageable and to try to plan ahead. So the first thing that I work through with artists is let's try to figure out these like these few different concepts that are really unique to you. And let's come up with these cool things. Now, if we look at, let's say that for each one of those concepts, you do like one of those a week. So we just have to come up with 50 of them. Now, sure, that like that sounds like a lot, but we have to do that over the course of an entire year. So let's break that down into what we need to do this month. Uh, well, for that one idea, we have to come up with, let's say, four ideas uh, for that this month. That's not as complicated. So um, let's break it down into this, this smaller scale. But now that we have those categories broken down, um, let's make like a little notes thing in your phone. And every time that you come up with an idea that would fit into one of those categories, add it to the list and start to build this database of ideas, just like you would if you were hanging out or um, walking around or with your friends and you hear somebody say something that you think could be a really interesting song lyric. You probably jot that down in your journal or write it into a little notes thing on your phone. So now we're just at, we're already in the mind of a songwriter. Now let's just think a little bit in the minds of like a creative marketer. Um, and so if we can start to create a catalog of that stuff, then all we have to do is just commit to a few hours a month to sit down and come up with this content, um, plan it out and, uh, and put a plan for it together. And if we can break it down into these little like smaller tangible things that we do, um, a larger portion of the work in a, sh in, in a one sitting, as opposed to saying every day I have to come up with a new idea. Um, then I, I think that it can become a bit more manageable. So I would say perspective and then uh, breaking things down into a little bit more of a system uh, where we're planning ahead and we're, we're staying ahead of it instead of like waking up in the morning and being all anxious because you're not sure what you're going to post that day. So what about taking, like, you can you can plan a content for a month, but let's say something happens. Like, like recently we had the death of George Floyd and all the riots and protests. And we've also been in the midst of the coronavirus. How how can you repurpose content? Like, w how do you determine what should I post? Should I be posting this time? I don't want to sound tone sound tone deaf. I want to make sure that my content is still relatable, but I don't want to be offending anybody and things like that. So, how can you kind of plan for things like that? Like, what happens when something like that this comes up and you have to kind of like in the midst of everything just rethink of something real quick? That's a great question, and I don't think that there's anything that we can do to plan for things that have been as um, horrific and challenging as what's happened in the past few months. There's no way that we can, we can, uh, be able to have something already ready to go in that scenario. But what we can do is prepare with experience on how to be able to think creatively in that moment. Just like if you got a call for an opportunity to write with like the, the co-writer of your dreams, but you, the session is tomorrow. We don't have time to prepare now. We did all of that preparation for the past since we were a little kid and started falling in love with music and writing songs. And now the moment is there for us to deliver. So in a scenario like this where things, things change, um, I think that we, we base that 
um, we take the experience that we've had, and that's why we want to do these things when things are great. So when those challenges come, we've built up those strong habits. And the more strong habits we have and, and experience that we have, then we can come into these different situations with uh, a creative solution. Mm. And do you think it's important to still keep content on brand uh, as well as relatable to the time? And how can you manage that, uh, that balance of keeping it on brand but also relatable? I believe in just being personal to, or uh, authentic to yourself and that there's going to be people out there that will, that will connect. We, you know, we're, we're all our own unique individuals, but there's specific kind of groups that different people fall into. And I think when we try to appeal to everyone, we don't appeal to anybody. So I, I think it's less worried about like how can we be relatable and more just being like true to ourselves and what we're passionate about and believe that by that faith and what we do in our passion for what we do, the, the people that will align with it, we you know, we'll find it if it's meant to be found and if the, if the talent and the, you know, the purpose is there behind it. Right. I like that. That's a good marketing quote. I mean, that works for anything other than just the music industry too. When you try to appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. And that's just not just music industry. That's for anything really. Uh, that's, so that's a, that's a good like mental note to keep in mind when you're, when you're thinking of your, your artist branding and your marketing and where you want to go with yourself, keep those things in mind. If you can't appeal to everybody, like you can't appeal to every genre because clearly a pop singer is not going to appeal to a heavy metal singer and vice versa. So just keeping those things in mind and what you want to do with your image and your brand is, is going to be important for your success. So before an artist starts working with you and doing all the stuff that they have access to, the videographers, the photographers, the website designers, the state-of-the-art studio, you, what are some things that they should have before they go in and start creating content or working in a big studio like that? Well, I think it depends on where they're at in their career and what they're looking for help with. If, uh, if an artist is, uh, I'm, most of my clients are pretty well established. So they come to me with an idea for a project or an idea for a campaign, uh, or they just need me to mix a record for them. And those are a little bit more clear cut you know, things. They just need to come in with a, with a vision and uh, in a basic idea. And then we have a conversation in how we're going to prepare for that and then execute it. For someone that's looking to maybe take their first step into a more, um, say, uh, professional or uh, collaborative uh, production um, effort, some of the things that I think are really helpful to have thought about is uh, first, like what your goals are with your music. There's some people whose goals are to be, uh, you know, the top 1% of artists, that they're, they're going to be a household name uh, around the world and that, that no one is going to be able to have lived without hearing one of their songs, which I, I think can be a great goal to have. There's other artists that um, just want to be able to make a living making music and they're not really interested. Um, they're authentically not interested in having commercial success, not just saying that um, because they feel fearful of saying that, but they're authentically just interested in just making music for themselves, being fulfilled through that, and that they see that there's been an impact in a smaller way um, and maybe a local level or a regional level or in a certain like niche market, and they really, really authentically enjoy that. There's also a way to make a great living and have a great career and fulfilling artistic um, you know, process in that world. Um, and, uh, and then there may be someone that just wants to be a songwriter, uh, or there, there may be someone that has a different, like creative, um, uh, goal, like maybe a videographer or a designer that's looking for, uh, help with building their brand or maybe collaborating with me, with my clients, you know? So in any one of those cases, those are the different types of people that might, uh, reach out to me. And I think that having the goal in mind first, like the overall, like career goal in mind when you're early on in your career. Um, can be a very good thing for a producer like me to see uh, because then I know if I can help them, how I might be able to help them, uh, and it can start to generate ideas on that conversation um, you know, a little bit quicker. I think also being able to uh, present your music in some form. So if you're looking to uh, get into working with a, with a producer and you're early on in your career, um, you, you definitely want to be able to deliver something, even if it's like a voice memo on your phone um, but hopefully you have something a little bit more, um, you know, developed than that with a, you know, maybe a, a free software program on your laptop where you can deliver, hey, here's a couple of like, ideas that I have. Uh, this is kind of the vibe that I'm going for in the direction uh, to be able to give a starting point for the conversation. So the producer doesn't need to uh, dive in by just asking all those, you know, those questions. Uh, the other thing that is really great is not so much as what they need to tell me, but what they need to know themselves is understanding how the business of music operates. 
because if you can do some research on that on the front end, you will find yourself in uh, getting not getting put in um, some some situations or hopefully avoiding you know some negative situations where you're either you know wasting time or money or uh, just not being able to communicate in a in a way to uh, to be able to negotiate a project or you know or move it forward. So um like understanding what a producer does versus what a recording studio does. Uh, or what a uh, tracking engineer does versus a mixing engineer um, is, uh, you know, not too complicated information to, to discover. And it's good things to have just very foundational understanding, I think, um, going in. Uh, and then just a project vision. Uh, what is it that what, what deliverables are you looking to create? Uh, so, you know, just the, the goals, understanding of the business and, and what are you looking to put together? I think there's some good things to know on the on the front end. Absolutely. I like the point that you make where it's it's important to know the business side. And that's the whole point of this podcast is to help educate people on the business side of, of the music business and keep them motivated. Uh, because the business side is very, it can be really in the weeds. And there's so much to know about a little bit about everything, you know, and you talked about you do sync licensing, you do content creation, you do, you know, there's copyrights, there's songwriting credits, there's producer credits, there's all those types of things. What a good, what's a good rate for a recording studio? What's a good rate for a background musician, for a live show, how to work out a touring deal, things like that. Like there's so many things that go into everything and understanding just a basic foundation of, of music industry 101 is, is so critical uh, and not going into things blindly. Like you might want to do music full time, but you, you've got to know how things work so you don't get screwed because there are creeps out there that will take advantage of you, people like you. If they see potential in you, they will sign you and could potentially ruin your entire career. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and for people that are looking for that, the two books that I tell everybody about is How to Make It in the New Music Business um, by Ari and um, uh, what's the it's other a, one? All You Need great to Know book, About. It's a great book, by the way. All you need to know about the music business. What'd you say? I said that's a great book. Absolutely, and I, <laughs> I love Ari's version because it comes from the the story of an artist, and that I really uh, t- tied into that because it, there's tangible examples uh, with also with the technical ideas, and it's it's modern. It shows like how the new world is kind of coming together and, and how you can make a great living through through music even if uh, you're not like a household name yet. Um, and then there's the um, book by Donald Passman um, that is just kind of a mainstay in every sort of like music business course or, you know, it's kind of the, the first book that everybody goes to. It's updated a lot. Um, that is all you need to know about the music business. And that's a great book, but it's more from like the technical uh, side of things and a very great introduction to the to the legal side. I wouldn't say it's an end all be all. But between if you go and read those two books um, and for, for people that don't know a ton about the industry, those are the two books that I say, go buy them today and read them and then come back to me and <laughs> Uh, and and uh, I think that those cover the range of the things that are really good, just foundational things to understand. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm a little bit biased because I, I mean I work for Ari, but yeah, like you you hit the nose right on the head for uh, for Ari's book. Is it, it he takes a very practical uh, experience, and you the the whole point of the book is you don't need to be signed to a major label to make it in the in the music business. Uh, it's it's a whole new world, and there's so many artists and so many platforms out there where you can make a living. Uh, so you don't need a major record label deal to uh, make that living. Are you an artist yourself, or do you play any instruments? I would say that we're all uh, artists if we're involved in the you know the creation of it. But as far as like a performing artist, um, I'm not. Um, I I dabble in a few different instruments. I do a lot of programming. Um, I found early on in my, uh, childhood and my, my love for music was really in the sounds and the experience and the impact that it had. And that's what I dove really deep into was figuring out how did they make those sounds? What was that effect? Uh, how was that song arranged that automatically made me feel a certain emotional way? I really got in love with dynamics in songs when I was a kid. I didn't know that they were called dynamics then. I was just like, dad, play the song with the cool breakdown. And, uh, and those, that was the stuff that I wanted to hear. I wasn't as excited about the guitar solo. I was more excited about like the breakdown and the hand claps and like, and then when it built back up and the big impact and the emotional roller coaster that you can go on listening to a song. So I think that was where like the roots of my, um, our artistry, uh, as a producer, um, came from, uh, I play enough to be able to write with my artists and help come up with melodies. And, uh, and then I do a lot of programming. Uh, that that I, I really enjoy working on projects where we blend in um, synthetic or pop elements with organic instruments. 
Uh, I love the sound of that, the just collaboration of just the natural thing that happens, moving air through a room, and then what can happen with the the crazy technology that we have and these really cool sounds that go to the ends of the, you know, sonic spectrum, you know, to mess with. And uh, some projects I work on that have more pop stuff or more synthetic programming than live instruments, um, but I, I love both of them and I love the intersection um, between them. Uh, so that's kind of where my artistry and, like, musicianship uh stance and then i work in a in a town uh like nashville where we have access to some of the best musicians in the world and it's a privilege to be able to just pick up the phone and and call the perfect person that played on the last like 10 records of the artist that the artist that you're working with is really inspired by and like we know that we can go after like those types of sounds and that type of um like thought uh not to copy anything but to be uh, to find those like ideas and inspiration, you know, around it or the records that inspired us. I can bring the people on that have just that feel or the groove, the style or, you know, the thing that we're, that we're going for. Um, so it's a great place to, you know, to work in, in that sense as a producer that doesn't, doesn't necessarily want to play all of the instruments. Yeah, absolutely. When you have, when you have a whole arsenal of people, you can just pick up the phone and call and they're some of the best in the world. Like you mentioned, that's definitely a big, huge advantage, uh, to any musician to be able to, Hey, pick up and, and call, uh, Ariana Grande's drummer or Justin Bieber's drummer on his last tour and, and to be able to combine those. And it's, that's that's got to be incredibly inspirational and you know you're working you know the artist that you're working with is also hugely inspired by the artist that's drumming uh for their new record or whatever what kind of music do you typically listen to do you listen to pop music do you listen to a lot of rock music like what type of music do you typically listen to when you're not in the studio or even what time what type of music did you listen to growing up it depends on what i'm doing uh, so the the cool thing about me growing up is that my my dad was like just this gigantic music fan he had um, so many records and cassette tapes and then CDs and uh, just all over all over the place. And, um, and he was always um, discovering new music and then sharing it with me, some of which when I was a little kid I appreciated and others I didn't understand at, you know, at the time. But he introduced me to all this different stuff. He also loved taking me to concerts. And, uh, and he would take me to all kinds of different concerts. There'd be concerts that were more music that like he was into, but then like, I also convinced them once to take me to a, a Master P and Snoop Dogg concert. And like, he would, <laughs> he, he, uh, he got dressed up with a no limit chain on and came and, and watched the show with me. And, uh, it was so much fun. Um, but we would, I mean, we'd go to like hard rock shows. Um, we, we'd go to hip hop shows. We'd go to classic rock shows, um, all kinds of different, um, different music. And, uh, he really got into like electronic music too. And, uh, would take me to like, see the blue man group, which is like a crazy combination of art and music. So growing up, uh, I was really enthralled by all these different types of music. And I started to understand maybe through like middle school and high school, how there were different styles of music that I loved for different types of experiences, depending upon the mood that I was in and, you know, and what I was doing. Uh, and that's continued to, to this day. So it really just, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, if I'm working out in the morning, I'm listening to stuff that's pretty strong, like motivational, uh, uh, like hip hop or rock music, um, or, uh, um, something that, or like punk music, like something that just has a lot of energy and, and emotion, uh, in it that just kind of gets you lit up for the day. Um, if I'm chilling out on the lake on the weekends, um, I like listening to Motown. I like listening to Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and, you know, the crooners and, um, and I like listening to classic rock stuff. Um, and, uh, and then just as a daily, as a, as a weekly practice, I'm also just in, uh, engaging in all of the stuff that's coming up the charts and some of the main genres that I do a lot of, uh, work in, which is mainly, uh, top 40 country, um, hip hop and rock. Uh, and which is still a pretty broad range. Um, but I just, I love all these different styles. So I just find myself falling into these cool environments with different artists and, uh, I'm able to take these different ideas, you know, combine them together. Uh, so it just, it sort of, it depends on the, the, um, the, you know, the experience, uh, that I'm in. I, I'm really not partial to one, uh, specific genre. That that's cool because it's it's we're in a world where we can access you know uh, nine dollars or ten dollars a month will get you access to Spotify and or Apple Music where you've got access to forty fifty million songs, but virtually every song that ever existed on the planet is is available to you. Uh, yes, and another so you, you, like twenty thousand every week that are going up, right? So. Right. Yeah, I think Spotify has forty thousand every week that are being up, which is absolutely insane. 
uh, uh, that much music that's going up and, and constantly. That's, that's crazy. So transitioning just a little bit, it, you have a, a state-of-the-art huge studio where you do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but the, it seems to me that a lot of artists that are independent or just trying to starting out are going to like home studios and they're building out these really big and elite home studios. Like what's the advantage of, of having a, a home studio versus going into studio with somebody like you? Uh, and, and how, how is the big studio kind of manageable in, in today's era? Um, well, I think it's what it depends upon the artist and the genre of music and what they're creating and the level that they're at in their career. I think that there is this what I believe to be a misconception that the like large format commercial studio isn't needed anymore. The idea that like, well, you can make like a Grammy winning record in your bedroom. Yeah, sure. Like one person can. And uh, and they did, you know, could do a great job at that. But where was that record mixed? And uh, and who was involved in the mastering of it and the you know the whole process um, overall? But that's one example uh, in one specific genre. If you look at like the whole of music, um, large format commercial studios still exist because there's definitely certain styles of music that need to be recorded in them. Uh, for example, like in the country music market, uh, even though country has moved very pop and a lot of stuff is able to be done sort of track by track or built out in a more pop driven um, format the style of the music and the energy for the most part, like producers will say like, I, you know, we still like love the, the, the feel of a, putting a rhythm section in a room and also the collaborative nature of what happens when you put some of the best session players in a room together to create uh, in the sense where it's not a band, but you're, you know, you're hiring the players to put it together. And I firmly believe in the idea of putting people in a room and, and locking them in there and getting down to the creative, you know, process as opposed to leaving each person to their own devices in their own space and kind of building it, you know, from the ground up for the most part, but in some cases, you know, to work in, in different ways. And then there's also aspects that, um, like you can't record an orchestra in a home studio. Um, you can't record a 30 person choir in a, uh, in a bedroom. Uh, so there's, um, there's certain things like that, that, you know, that, that, that are definitely, um, required. Um, there's also a lot of visual content. So um, while you can make pretty cool videos in, in, a, in a more stripped down environment with some cool lighting and, and that sort of thing, um, it can still look very interesting and impressive and exciting to do a live stream from a big studio in a huge room that sounds awesome and has a cool look to it and may engage with your fans a bit more. Uh, so there's, um, there's a lot, there's a uh, you know, number of uses in that way. Uh, and I, I, but I think that the way that at least the way that my idea of um, managing what the record shop is in my mind, more of a production company than a recording studio because recording studios, their primary income source is booking studio time by the day. And it's just a rental, you know, they rent the space. Um, while we have day rates and while we do have people that rent our space, my focus is primarily to be working on projects. And so within the uh, scope of that project, the studio is going to be booked for a certain you know cost, but we're working on a larger vision project and a longer term sort of thing than just one person that comes in one day and the next day and, uh, and the next day. And I, for me, that's been a great way to be able to keep a, uh, a studio of this size um, running and, and, and working well by having a wide variety of things that, that we're involved in. Um, and then if, if it's something that we're not experts at, bringing someone in to manage that, you know, that, that, that project, if it's a visual project or a, um, we're, we're doing a, a live stream for a, uh, for a corporate um, presentation uh, webinar thing where they can't go out to their big conference. So they're going to do it from the studio because they wanted something with really great audio and a good visual and, you know, and good lighting. And, um, and so those types of things um, we're finding creative uses uh, for the space uh, as well. That's, that's great. And I like your explanation is, is kind of putting things in, into terms. It's like, Oh, I don't need to go to a big studio, but you come to think of it, like if you're going to record a, a st- a huge orchestra or a, a choir, you're not going to be able to do that in your studio apartment. That's not going to happen. So you're going to have to go to a big studio with, you know, and obviously getting, uh, you would want to do that anyways to capture the, the, with the different mics and the positioning and the flexibility you have with all the gear, that would obviously be a no brainer to do. Yeah. I think the other thing that's important is that there's these, there's like maybe, so someone's trying to capture like a, a classic rock, like 70s sound or something. And that, that record was recorded in a huge room with open space. And a lot of the sound comes from the bleed and the, uh, the environment and the sound of the room itself. 
And then someone argues, well, I have all of this equipment that I can put in my garage and I can get the same kind of thing because I'm going to use a similar amp or something, you know. Uh, but a really big portion of it as well comes from the people that you're working with. So the, you know, the space is awesome. You know, the gear is cool. Uh, you know, whatever, all of that can be argued and debated. Um, but the collaborative effort and having someone with the experience to really fine tune that vision and help you through the process and have a team member, you know, through the, through the support of it all, um, that can be a really added value to working with uh, a production company or working at a major studio with a major producer, because most uh, larger format commercial studios don't necessarily have producers on staff. They would have engineers on staff and then the producer would book the studio for you. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's a good point too, is a lot of times, you know, you want to emulate the, the 70s sound and sure you can do that in plugins, but that's, there's obviously going to be, it's, it's going to be somewhat negligible. Like it's not going to be perfect. Whereas you can go into a studio and literally use the same exact gear that was used to record that specific album or specific song that you were going for. And you're going to achieve that same sound. And that's just not something you can emulate in plugins like it's obviously getting much better but using the out outboard gear in the board is it's just like it's there's nothing matched you can't you can't compare to it absolutely so how has the large commercial format studio for you or how has your business kind of changed since the pandemic started has it changed at all or what are some things that you've had to shift around the, the, the main thing that changed is sort of like the obvious that you go from having a bunch of people in the room to having a bunch of people on zoom uh. And so, so now we're just doing a, you know, a bunch of remote stuff. Um, we're using some really cool software to allow us to do that. Um, there's a plugin um, called Audio Movers that allows you to stream from your DAW to a private website link or to the plugin in another person's DAW, which allows me to be able to um, hear the audio that, that uh, maybe a session player is overdubbing something and I can hear it through my speakers uh, in real time, or I can send the the track that I'm working on to the artist to listen to in real time on like the website link. Um, that's been super helpful. I've been able to normally where I would maybe have like a manager and, uh, and, and someone from the label and like the artist come in to review like final mixes. Now we're able to do that from, from their home. I can just send them the link and, uh, and they can pull it up. Uh, the other cool thing has been utilizing uh, screen sharing through zoom. So, uh, I had, a um, an artist that was just working on like a cover song, like YouTube video that they were doing. It wasn't something that they would always like come in the studio to do, uh, was something that they didn't need to come in the studio to do with us. They could do it at home in that specific scenario, but they were having trouble getting like the, the, the final like mix, like balanced out. So they called me up and said, Hey, could you, um, help, could I send this over to you to mix? And I was like, it's not really the smartest investment for you to, you know, to do that just for this, you know, cover thing. And it sounds pretty good where it's at. Why don't I try to help you mix it from here? So we, we exper we did this experiment and now I've done it a dozen times since then, um, where I can, uh, uh, use audio movers to send the audio, um, into my, uh, system here in the, in the control room. And then I can pull up the screen share thing. And with my mouse, I can control their screen and help them mix their song, on their system while listening to it on mine, which is super cool. Uh, we also set up, since uh, all the live uh, shows have been canceled, our uh, our live recording rig that is usually traveling all over to, to different events and festivals and stuff is just sitting here. Um, and so I, th I thought, well, how can we put this to work? So I called a few artists that I knew had material ready to record, but they didn't have the equipment at home. And I said, well, what if I put together this mobile studio package where I, I can leave it outside the, the studio or we can deliver it to you? And, um, well, it'll be a contact-free, you know, studio delivery. And, well, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the microphone that you normally use in the studio. I'll give you this interface that's a really high-end interface with, with great preamps um, and a laptop. All you got to do is turn this thing on and then log into this thing, and then I'll control it from there. And that's worked really well with a handful of artists over the past couple of months. Uh, so um, I don't know if that's something that will continue on, but it's been a great, like, you know, um, a solution uh, for the time being. I would say the biggest thing that came out of it was artist realization of the value of live streaming, which I have been um, adamantly pushing towards artists for a while with the, just the massive reach that you can get. And now that YouTube is expanding into live streaming and uh, and Instagram is, is really pushing it, you know, more, I'm... Um, see, and then with all of this happen, all the shows get canceled and immediately artists all of a sudden now they love live streaming. They're like, let's jump up and play a show for our friends, try to make some tips. 
And uh, for a lot of for a lot of our artists, at least in the mid level area, the mid level artists that we work with, it's been a pretty profitable endeavor for them when they they'd already put in the work building a bit of a fan base up. But the challenge is that the audio is kind of you know depends upon the space that you're in um, and the device that you're using. Uh, the video can be kind of grainy and inconsistent. It depends on like your you know your connection. Um, and now everybody's doing it. So like, how are you going to set yourself apart? And uh, so my, my idea for a long time has been able to utilize our facility for a, for a really cool look and a higher end and a really high quality sounding live stream. And it's been uh, a little challenging to help artists see the value and, you know, in, in doing that until now. So uh, I would say that one massive thing that happened in this period of time was that it really accelerated my interest in integrating a higher end live streaming system into the studio. So we are just about to start launching our um, our live our live streaming at a much higher level, where we have a uh, completely integrated um, network and system for um, uh, for setting up the stream. Uh, we'll have a multicam switcher with um, that. Right now, we're not going to do any 4K, but eventually, the ability to do 4K, but just none of the platforms do it. So just but but HD. Um, studio quality audio, and then we're going to capture all of the content during the live stream to be repurposed later um, for whatever purpose that the artist would want to use it for. And I, I, I think that that's probably the maybe the, the biggest like shift that wasn't necessarily something that we had to do, but that I was just motivated to finally pull the trigger and had a little bit of extra time to get all the logistics together to make it happen. Yeah, so the... Uh, that's interesting that you bring up streaming because it's so it's such it's a revolutionary and like you've been pushing artists to do it for a, quite a while so just recently bts the korea uh, the k-pop group held a concert it's called bang bang con virtual concert and it completely smashed records uh they did a hundred minute live stream and it reached a peak of 750,000 concurrent viewers across 107 countries that is, can, and it was like the, the article goes into how many st basically stadiums that is. And that's like, what was like 30 or something stadiums. And they made like an astonishing, like close to a hundred or more million dollars just in that hundred minutes. It, it's insanity. And there's virtually no limits on a live stream. Like you can go live on Instagram and you can have everybody in the world streaming your profile. And that instant access to anybody in the world is, is so important to connect with fans in real time. So can you, can you provide some tips that you've, or maybe some, some hurdles that you've had to jump over for those that are just getting into live streaming and maybe even some gear that you would recommend uh, using during a live stream? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I think that the initial hurdle is going to be continuing to do it when no one's watching it. Because when you, if you're first starting it, no, your audience, if you have an audience yet, they don't know that you're going to be there doing it. Um, and, and if you're still building that audience, you may not have enough to where it's going to, you're, you're not going to have the BTS numbers, you know, and that can be a little deflating because you hear everybody talking about, oh, live streaming, live streaming. But then it's all in the context of these like massive artists that have this built in thing uh, already. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I work with an artist named Cassie Joy who is an incredible uh, performer, an amazing vocalist, and a really, really uh, thoughtful entrepreneur. And her and her husband um, manage her business as an artist. Uh, she was a, a contestant on The Voice um, a couple years ago, did really well on the show, built up a, a pretty decent fan base through that. But where things really got cooking was after she got off and the show and started diving into grassroots building her fan base. One initiative that she started was doing a stream once a week. And she started that, I would say, a little over a year ago. Uh, perfect timing for getting this started. And she was doing it once a week. Uh, and every week she would jump on there. She would get song requests from people throughout the week. Um, she started something she called like Music Mondays where she shoots a, um, a, a, a real basic music video on her own of a cover song that one of her fans recommends. So creating like fan engagement through that. Um, and then, and then she could ask somebody on the stream for it. And so she's getting these people like really engaged through the, um, the content that she's doing. But the most important thing was that she did it consistently, um, every week for, I, I believe at least a year, if not a year and a half before the pandemic hit. Now, when that happened, she was one of the artists that is not a top name artist that is, that is not, uh, 
you know, doesn't hasn't had a hit uh, on Top 40 Radio yet, but has had some pretty good career success, definitely. Um, but she spent that period of time consistently building that audience. So when this happened, now there's so many more people online, and immediately those numbers like skyrocketed. In the first stream she did, she had thirty thousand viewers, uh, which which is um, the amazing for for someone uh, that is in that in that position to be able to just jump up and and do that and have it built in. But that happened because of the consistency and the and the belief and the foresight of understanding the value of the market and the true like interest in just building a fan base and knowing that in order to do that, you have to be there consistently to be able to share. Um, now when you're doing it consistently, my other tip would be how to keep it interesting. So like, you're not gonna be able to play like the same set every single time. Uh, whereas if you're on tour and you're playing a bunch of different cities, you know, you play the same set every night. So that can get a little challenging, especially if you're like, I'm going to do this once a week or I'm gonna do this twice a week. So um, one thing that, some, that I've started to see some people do and that, that I've been working with a few artists on is coming up with like a concept uh, sort of thing. So maybe you do a, a, a night that's like a 70s inspired night and then you dress up in a, like in a, in a certain way and, you know, in a, in a fun, a fun uh, uh, sort of environment uh, or idea around it. Um, or you engage with your followers uh, maybe throughout the week leading up to it and have little, I don't know, gi giveaways um, little like merch thing or something like that where like request a song and if your song gets picked out of the hat then we'll send you a t-shirt and we'll play your song for you um, and maybe maybe you maybe you attach a monetary amount for you know for requesting a song um, or maybe you just do it for free for the you know for the engagement um, but come up with some some creative ways of of getting people interested in coming on and you know and wanting wanting to watch uh, and, and I think that those, those are a couple of things, just consistency and figuring out how you can, you know, set yourself apart in that way. As far as equipment, um, there's one thing that we started using early on that was, that was, uh, really awesome. There's a company called DPA microphones that we do a lot of work with and we love their, their, uh, their microphones. We use them a ton in our studio and they came out with this, um, interface called the device. And it is a, probably a little bit larger than like a it's probably like the size of like two half dollars, uh, like in circumference. And it has a Thunderbolt cable on it that will plug into your phone. And then it has two screw ons for DPA, uh, uh, clip on microphones. And so you, you have a two input, um, interface that goes up to 96 K, which is super high fidelity audio that you can plug into your phone with a really simple app that you can record onto your phone, uh, with the device. And then you can also stream, uh, using it as the audio source for your for your live stream. So say you're a singer songwriter and you just really want to up the the quality of uh, of what your your the the audio is, but you don't want to have like a whole interface and your computer and microphones and all that stuff set up. You get this thing and it's very sleek. You, you know, you set it down. Um, you can set it down at your feet. You got your phone. You set it up. You turn it on. You clip the mic onto your guitar so there's no mic stands or anything. And then you can take another mic and, and clip it onto your shirt. It's a really, really nice, like, lavalier microphone. And um, th they're known for just really high quality, really pristine sounding microphones. And uh, and there you got a guitar vocal setup with no junk in front of you. Uh, really great, great, clear sound. Uh, so I think that th that that for me was probably the coolest thing that we discovered uh, during this time as far as, like, equipment goes. Uh, I would say that like so a lot of people like oh, maybe uh, have a little oversight on lighting. Um, make sure that like your your background is maybe like kind of cool or you know or vibey in some way. If your vibe isn't that, then like I saw an artist that like literally did like live from my closet and he just went in like his messy closet and played a bunch of songs and it was super cool. It was funny. It was entertaining. Um, and uh, and his whole thing during this period of time was going to all these not like different places, but like different locations, like in his house or somewhere outside. Um, and uh, and just he was finding some creative ways to be able to not have the same single thing, the same uh, thing happening over and over again, uh, which I thought was really cool. That's a lot of really good information and some good tips uh, as as well. There's so much helpful information. And what was the company and the device called again? The company is DPA Microphones. And the device is called device. Device, cool. I'm gonna check them out after and and see what they're all about. Um, so, what about do you do you have the artists uh, that are going live on live streaming? Do you have like a set schedule? Like, do you have them tell uh, their fans that hey, I'm going live every week on Tuesday, and you kind of like promote that? Like, how important is kind of promoting it, or do you just go live and just expect people to show up? Yeah, I, I definitely don't would not recommend just going live and expecting people to show up unless you're BTS. 
so it's de- definitely promoting it, preparing for it. Um, but I think a really important thing to mention about promotion that kind of ties back into business is I see a lot of artists um, just promoting with, before they've built the relationship yet. So just going out and like the only thing is like, hey, come and watch me on this live stream, period. Not like, here's what you're going to get when you come. Here's what the experience would look like. Um, here's the community that you might find. Uh, but just the really blanket statement of, hey, I'm doing this. You should watch it. And um, that would be the equivalent to like walking up to someone at the bar and not trying to have any conversation and saying, um, hey, let's be in a relationship now. You know, there's just you have to have that uh, introduction and, uh, and, you know, and sharing something. So with that idea, instead of just saying, um, hey, come and watch this live stream, I'm going to do it every Tuesday, uh, maybe uh, talk about maybe some of the interesting songs that you might want to play, maybe tell a story about a certain song that maybe you know a lot of people would like or maybe a, a, a fan favorite of yours and like a little background on it and hey I'm going to do this this um stripped down rendition of this this song that um that that has gotten a lot of attention or a lot of you know uh um likes or something like that uh or uh, just sharing what the experience is going to be like or maybe doing like a behind the scenes like hey I'm setting up for my live stream um look at like how this, you know, this room is now and then show it after it's like, after you make it over with like some cool lighting and a little backdrop or, um, you know, whatever it is. Those are just some you know, ideas that popped off uh, my head, but the general idea being make it something that people can engage with and create a story around it. Um, as opposed to just the blanket thing of doing what 95% of the other people are doing and just saying, Hey, come and watch me because I'm here. That's a, that's a good point. I like the idea of kind of like, hey, I'm setting up for my live stream, come chat with me or something like that for the next 15 or 20 minutes while I get set up and kind of do sound check. Uh, that would, that's kind of a cool like behind the scenes moment uh, that, that fans really dig into. You know, it goes back to your kind of brand. Like if you can be relatable, it's, it's, you're much more enduring and you're much more attractive when, when you can be relatable and you, you actually look like and sound like a human. Because uh, obviously, like it takes people to set that up, uh, so it doesn't just happen. So you know, using that behind the scenes moment to to take advantage of that is 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 cool. I like that that idea of content. Yeah, totally. I mean, being a musician is cool, right? And and so that's one of the reasons, like when we were kids, that we wanted to do it because like those guys are cool. And now we're in an age of the entertainment industry where the fans really want to get like the behind the curtain um, understanding of what it's like. So show them the interesting, like cool life that you have in the, in the stuff that you're doing. Um, because people are, are really interested in that. Um, they're, they're not as interested in, in just being told what to do, uh, especially when they're seeing it from everybody. Yeah. There, I mean, there's an artist that I follow, uh, his name is Sullivan King. He's, he lives in Miami and he's like, he mixes like really heavy metal. That's kind of where he comes from. And then he mixes it with like really heavy dubstep. And he showed like his apartment tour and he was like showing all of his guitars and, uh, kind of telling the story of them and how he smashed one of them. And then he was saying, oh, I got this one from here. And it was like a really cool, like he's not just this guy that goes and plays music and then just disappears. He's an actual human being that lives in an apartment and he's got all of his gear and his guitars. It was like really cool to watch. It was like a 15 minute video and hearing the different stories that he had with each guitar and uh, just kind of blending in his humor as well. It was it was really interesting to watch, and it's like it makes me want to come back for more and learn more about him as an artist. Absolutely, yeah, it's a great example. Are any of the artists that you're working with that are doing live streaming are they making a living and paying all of their bills on this type of thing, or are they doing supplemental things on the side uh, to to keep stay afloat? Um, I would say that um, it's split. There's a handful that I know of that are making some pretty substantial revenue. I wouldn't say that it has completely replaced all of the rest of the revenue that would normally come in from like, you know, normal thing. But they're definitely like there, there's enough, a good amount of artists that are coming in and doing streams here that are making as much or more than they would have netted after going, driving down to Florida to do a show or driving up to New York to do a show or something like that. Uh, and, and like, you know, on a, on a per stream, you know, basis also considering that they don't have to travel or have the expense of, you know, anything else or they're, 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 um, cutting down a lot of that, that expense and the time. Um, and they're, and they're, they're making as much or if not more in, in, uh, in those cases. And it seems to happen fairly consistently. It wasn't like a one-time thing. And then it, you know, it started to drop off except for the artists that 
haven't started to shift to figure out how to make it continue to be unique. We have found that when you sort of just show up again and again and without much like anticipation or like a different type of um, approach that the, that it can start to kind of decline a little bit, but not to the point where like people were totally disappearing. Uh, but I, and, um, and I, I think that as it evolves and as we can become a bit more creative about the experience that we create, um, that it could, it, I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't get to a point where at least for like a, a, a mid-level tiered artist that they could replace a good amount of like where their profit margin would come from or where their, where their like take home money would be from like going on the road in uh you know, in a, in a, in a, in a lot of scenarios. Um, but again, that depends on, on what you're delivering. Um, there, there's, um, there's also artists that are not, um, you know, profiting in the same way at all, but I think that's more a case of that they're starting at the ground floor now building that fan base. So as they continue to do it consistently, then I think that they'll find their audience if they can, as they start to figure out where their, um, unique, uh, delivery is going to be. Sure. So for those that are, that are listening that may not know, like live streaming, like going live on Facebook, how am I, how are, are artists making any money on that? Can you explain how they're making money live streaming on whatever platform they're using? And if, is there a platform that's better than another, or how how does it kind of how does it kind of work? And how how does an artist make money when they're live streaming? On the Facebook, Instagram, YouTube live stream, the way generally that they're doing it is that they're they're creating a virtual, what's called like a virtual tip jar, which is basically your PayPal link, your Venmo link, your Cash App link, uh, either dropped in like the comments or in the description of the video, or uh, there's now a site that is called uh, My Set, uh, something to that extent, and there they can add a graphic to it. Uh, and then the new system that we're going to put in the studio, it has an integrated thing too, where we'll be able to add the artist logo, the graphics, whatever links are going to need to be in there, um, all embedded into it, just like it would for like a newscast or something. Uh, so that's a, that's another sort of like next tier option that started to, um, to come about. Um, but that's how people are, are, um, getting paid. Now the way that the, the way in which that, that's where the transaction is happening. Now the way in which that transaction occurs depends upon the artist. Some people are asking, you know, would like ask for tips in the same way that they would if they were playing like as a bar band. Um, other people will offer certain things. Other people will just sell merch and say, Hey, Venmo me for, you know, if, if you'd like this t-shirt or, um, you know, or that sort of thing, or they'll, um, have maybe their significant other, um, or their family member or something come on and, and maybe do a little presentation in between a song or something and, you know, and share something, uh, you know, you could get, creative uh with it like hey mom come and model the t-shirt um that uh that we're that we're yeah, about to launch as a you know limited uh covid giveaway or something or uh sale you know so there's uh there's different ways to to do it that way so some artists feel a little bit like they're like um busking you know in in a, in a negative way which i don't think is negative but some of them have a negative connotation with it like i don't want to feel like i'm like begging for stuff but um, but there's definitely a little bit of a challenging spot with that. Now, one of the interesting things is that a couple of weeks ago, Facebook announced that they were going to start to allow people to, to create events and sell tickets for events, um, on the platform. So as opposed to just creating the event and then people saying that they're going to go, now you can create an event and sell tickets, uh, which could be a total game changer for that situation where that whole entire transaction, if your fan base is on Facebook, which depending upon your age and your demographic may or may not be. Um, but in that specific scenario for the, the artists that do have that fan base there, that could be a really interesting shift um, to allow it to turn in, into that. Uh, and also a way where you could go to a venue and like your, your, show, your, so, your show is sold out or maybe you have a fan base that's in a different region that would love to see your show and you're not able to hit that city. Now you could live stream your show from that club and sell tickets to it. Uh, with virtual tickets to it, you know? Uh, so there's some uh, uh, interesting, interesting things with that. Yeah, there's definitely, that's, there's so much information. And uh, Ari, uh, he started a, an online music festival when the whole shutdown called Uncanceled Music Festival. And it's, I mean, they've raised over 100,000 
dollars. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are now, but it's it's just astronomical. And I mean, they got coverage on Billboard and Rolling Stone and virtually every big publication. And it, it's just super cool how something like that can just take off. And, and people people are just so interested and so hungry for live music that they'll, I mean, they'll pay $10 for an hour show and it's online. And it's just crazy how the whole world just shifted overnight and just... <laughs> It, I just find it so amazing. And we have that technology to be able to do that on top of it. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, this did not exist. If, if we would have had a pandemic 15, 20 years ago, we, I mean, we would have been SOL. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's amazing that this stuff is there. It's allowed uh, our business to continue to, to thrive through this. And, and, and it's allowed us to find a new revenue streams for, for artists to, you know, to, to supplement or maybe replace some of the stuff that's, uh, you know, that's been lost, which is a really great thing to have. Transitioning just a little bit more before we kind of wrap things up is we're, we're talking about live streaming and, you know, kind of readapting to what's going on in the world. Uh, you can't just give up as a musician. You've got to keep going. And if you have a true passion for what you're doing, you will continue to evolve and learn and adopt new, new ways to reach your fans and kind of uh, do what they want. Uh, so, I want you to talk about, because this is something you had mentioned, is doing what you love and earning a living doing it. And that's now that's kind of like live streaming because live shows have shut down. But there's so many other ways you can make a living now. And doing what you love is such a passion and so important for you to be able to do that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such, it's, well, it's such a giant uh, you know, topic that can that can span in a number of different directions. But I'll give a little like context to why I'm so passionate about it. I was really fortunate to figure out that when I when I was in when I was about 12 years old, that I was either going to be a professional hockey player or a record producer. And uh, by high school, I figured out that I was going to be a record producer. And uh, I I was really fortunate to be able to figure that out young. And and there wasn't. Um, there was no debate. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And I didn't think twice about it. I graduated from high school. I, it, you, you couldn't really just get a job at a studio at the time that I graduated without having some sort of like certificate or degree or experience. So I went to a small trade school and then I moved to one of the th three options that I considered for where to live if you're going to create, a, be, be a producer, uh, which was Nashville. But I've experienced many other people that have had uh, a little bit more of a challenging path to be able to figure out what that is. What is it that really fulfills me and that I'm passionate about? And then once they figure it out, a lot of people, when you're in a, the creative space, especially when you're an artist, people look at that as like, oh, well, that's your hobby, but like, what do you make a living doing? Or like the really funny question that that I uh, that I don't really get anymore, but that uh, that I used to get when um, when people would come in is, um, so like, is this your like full time job? And like so many people would ask me that uh, back when I was just working more as like a studio and less like production company. So it'd just be, you know, the random person coming in to record a demo. And they just assumed that there was no way that someone could make a living uh, just recording people's music that, you know, I had to have, you know, my part time job that supplemented my hobby. And, uh, and so there's just that idea in society that um, th that tells us like, well, you know, you better have like a backup plan. My message to everyone is to light your backup plan on fire after you figure out, after you're sure what you're passionate about. Agreed. I don't, I don't think that I would have survived through all the crazy stuff that has happened in my career if I, if I would have had an alternative option. And I've seen so many talented people that just couldn't get past that last hurdle of adversity and just reverted back to something that was safer or more secure. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong if they're happy with that. But if they're unhappy with that decision, th that's disappointing and, and disheartening to me. So that's why I want to share my story to be able to show that like it, it can happen, you can do it, and then there's going to be a bunch of people that tell you that that's crazy and that um, assume that this is your hobby and not your full-time job. Uh, but it it definitely can. And then I just I get so much fulfillment out of not feeling like I got to go to work every day. I just wake up and I'm excited to dive into uh, whatever's on the agenda and like the next thing. And it's a, it, it's just such a privilege to be able to uh, make a living doing that. So I want to help other people in that, you know, in that journey. Uh, now, like discovering that, I think a, a, a good like barometer for it is to be like really real with yourself when you, when you say like, how bad do I want to do this? And like, can I survive without doing this? Because if, if you want to be an artist, 
you better like not be able to survive without it if you want to get to a certain level in your you know in your career if it's cool if it's a part-time thing for you then awesome like that's that's great uh and, and you don't have to you know move beyond that but i'm speaking particularly to people that are saying i want to make a full-time living for the rest of my life and be able to like retire quote unquote retire you know as a as a performing artist or as a creative or you know music creator uh, and with that, you just got to be really true with yourself. Is like, is this what you're what you're meant to do? Do you have a gift for it, and are you talented at it? Uh, because that that's something that it just has uh, evolved in our culture around uh, you know the technology evolving and you know situations like are are you, do you people having access to things that they didn't have access to before? Um, do you have the talent for it? And um, and that is a, a really uh, important question to ask yourself also. Uh, and if it's not there yet, can you, what, what is there that you can, you know, you can develop? Uh, and, um, but the only way that you can fail as an artist is by quitting. And once someone told me, once someone told me that it gave me so much perspective on what success means and where that fulfillment can come from. Uh, and it took a lot of fear and concern out of it. Cause I knew that the only thing that I had to do was just keep going after it. And as long as I didn't, then there was no way I could fail. I could just keep moving towards, you know, something, you know, and get there. Um, so then how do we make a living um, through following uh, that passion? Well, I believe that if you believe that that is what you're meant to do and that there's not another option, then you're going to start to think creatively about how to make a living. I can really best speak from my experience. When I moved to Nashville for a job at a major studio that, uh, fell through after I'd moved here, after I had a lease on an apartment and enough money to survive for a couple months, I had to figure it out because I made the decision that I was going to do this for a living when I was like, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. But really like that decision started when I was like 12. So there was no way that, that I, at that point in my life, like, uh, but even with that level of um, passion and dedication that I had for following this, um, path and uh, packing up everything and without knowing a single person and moving to Nashville when I was 20, I, uh, I still, when, when that first job fell through, I still sat looking out the window of my apartment and questioning, like, did I make the right decision? Was I meant to do this? Luckily, I had that something in me that just told me like, yeah, you're going to do it and you're going to figure it out. And then I sat down and I started figuring it out. I got every book I could on entrepreneurship and business and the music industry. I started just trying to find resources anywhere I could, anybody that would talk to me, give me advice, you know, mentorship, and you just turn into a creative problem solver and you start figuring out, um, how can you get creative about turning this, um, this art that you have into a, into making a living and into a business. Uh, and that, that education can then lead into tangible action, which is super important. Uh, and so, so that's, that's where we need to take that idea that we have the passion for it. And then now let's find those, um, creative solutions to figure out how we can do that. Like in this scenario, when shows get canceled, um, the, the artist that, um, may not make it through it is going to say, well, my entire tour just got canceled. I better go find a part-time job. The artist that is going to make it through it as an artist is going to say, well, my entire tour got canceled. Let's take my tour virtually on the road and figure out creatively how to make that happen. And let's start that today. And, uh, and I think that that's the big, you know, differentiator is just for the creative problem solving. After you've figured out what you're going to do, and then you just lit your backup plans on fire and you're, you're going to figure it out one way or the other. Mm. That's incredible. Uh, in fact, it reminds me a little bit of my story too, because, you know, when I was, 18, I had made the decision to move from Minnesota to Florida to go to school for, uh, for music. And I, when I, I remember when I moved everything, my dad and my brother had helped me drive all the way down to Florida. I moved into my apartment, and I remember bringing them to the airport and dropping them off. And I got back to my apartment, it was like 4 a.m., and I went back to sleep because I had like four or five hours before class, I had to be in class. And I remember getting this gut-wrenching, my gut just sank to the floor. Like, I'm like... This is the first time I've ever been alone. I have no family. I hardly have any friends. And I can't, like, there, I have no backup plan. So if this fails, I'm going to have to figure this out. And I, I'm, I had no other choice but to keep pressing forward and going through school, meeting, networking with all the industry professionals, and doing everything that I possibly can to make it work. And I, ha and I did. 
but I always tend to put myself in situations where I have to just figure it out or else like I don't have a backup plan. I don't like having a backup plan because then it's like, oh, then I don't have to try as hard with what I'm doing because I can always go back to this. Like it's, it's okay. It's okay if I fail and it is okay if you fail, but it's, if you're failing for that reason, that's, that's not the reason to have a backup plan. So I always put myself into situations, whether that be like I buy a piece of gear that I can't afford. I'm like, well, shit, now I have to figure out and learn how to use this so I can make money using it. Uh, so it's just like those types of things. I always put myself in situation and I encourage people to do it. Maybe not moving across the country and going to school or something like that. That may not be feasible for everybody, but just put yourself in situations without having a backup plan and just forcing it to work. Uh, you, you'd be surprised at what you, you kind of turn your fight or flight mode on and you'd be surprised at what you can, what you can accomplish. Absolutely. And especially if that decision can be led by just a really firm belief of something that you're really, really passionate about. Um, not like diving into a career that you think is like safe and secure and then not having a backup plan from it, you know, but, but doing, doing that thing that, that you, that you really, really believe in, it can definitely fuel that ability. And, and it did for me. And it sounds like it absolutely did for you because I mean, look at you now and all you probably look around every day. And like you said earlier, you know, I'm, you're so honored to just wake up and not have to go to work. Like, like what do you, and it's like, oh wait, he is going to work, but he doesn't consider it work because he's so passionate about it that it's not even, it's not even work to him. Absolutely. Um, I will say the important thing to remember something that like really hit home with me recently and something that I think everybody struggles with is like every time that you grow to another level in this industry, uh, you think like, okay, well, once I get to this place, I'll have made it. Or once I get this award, like, okay, that was the thing. Now I'm going to be set. And uh, that was how I always thought about things or like kind of measured things before until I started working with people that had done like everything that I ever would could imagine having done and then recognizing that they're still in the same boat. Uh, every time that you level up, you're around people at a higher level and then those people and then you're kind of average within that level and then you can grow to a leader in that level and then you get in another tier of people. And that's just like life throughout any sort of career as it keeps going. So as much as I say that, that I don't feel like I have to go to work, which is totally true, um, I've been in the studio since 9 o'clock this morning. It's 10, 15 now, um, and I am totally happy to, to, to be here and, um, and still got more stuff to do before I, before I roll out. Um, but when I say that, I don't mean that it's easy and that there's not stress and that once you get to a certain place that you just coast and ride. Like my day is 12, 12 at minimum of like 12, 13-hour days, uh, Monday through Friday, 100% focused on serving my artists, my clients, getting our projects done and growing as a human being and as a business owner. And, uh, and in some cases that can be really stressful and struggle and, and, uh, and stressful. So my idea, like once I could get through these things, a, a real challenge of facing adversity was like, man, I thought that I had like gotten there. Like all this stuff was working out. I got all the things that I wanted, but it doesn't feel like I'm there yet. I still feel like there's somewhere else to go. So one of my clients introduced me to this book um, called, uh, their names are Claude Kelly and Chuck Harmony. Um, the two amazing pop writers that started a creative company in Nashville called Weirdo Workshop. And, uh, they started a really cool community gathering called Tiny Book Club, where we get together about once a month and we, we all collectively read a book under 200 pages that has something to do, uh, with personal growth or self-development or just an interesting, like political stance or a uh, cultural sort of like story. And then we get together and have a discussion about it. And one of the books that they brought um, to that to the club is called For Everyone, and it's written by an author named Jason Reynolds. And he put this whole experience in perspective for me in a really strong way. And there's a quote in that book where he said, uh, your dreams may be as close as lunchtime or as far away as forever. And when I read the, those words, just saying that just makes me emotional. When I read those words, I literally like got teary-eyed um, because I felt so um, understood and like all the thoughts that I've had and the feelings like throughout the growth of my career were like formulated into this one situation where like you never really know but the where where and when this sort of thing is going to happen. But what he recognizes by the end of this story is that you never really get there. The whole thing is the process and the experience along the way and everything that you learn. So when you hear about stories like mine or people that are like, oh, I don't have to work for a living. I'm not saying that like with uh, any sort of like ego or, or saying that like it's an easy ride once you get to a certain place. I'm just saying that I've found, found a level of fulfillment in my life where I don't think of it as work. I've integrated my life with my work and it's just all about the fulfillment of creative energy and just growth. And I get excited about that growth. 
So that's where I think is the key and the core of making a living through your passion is being able to integrate what you're doing to make money and what you're doing to be fulfilled in life and making that just all encompassing of like who you are and what your experience is. I love that uh, because, and, and it doesn't come off as e- egotistical or anything like that. It, to me, it's motivational for somebody in, in, in any realm of the creative arts, uh, specifically in music. If you can say that you are, you've made it and you're, you're making a living on your music and you don't hardly ever go to quote unquote work, I applaud you. Like that is an accomplishment that, that many, many musicians and creatives uh, yearn and want in their careers is to just be able to literally do what they love every single day, day in and day out. And to me, it's motivational when I can hear people like you literally wake up and be like, I'm excited to go to work and, and just be driven all day. And it motivates me to keep going. And like you had mentioned earlier, like you've never felt like you you I have made it. And that's kind of similar to me. Like I made it, I drove all the way to Florida, I went to school and I got to Florida. I'm like, well, now what? Well, I graduated and then I'm like, well, now what? And that was like every time I had a goal and my goal was to move out to Los Angeles. And I did last July, it's been a year, holy crap, a year. And I wor- I'm working for Ari, one of the best minds in the modern music business. And I'm like, well, now what? So I'm always setting goals for myself. And when you achieve those goals, it's like, you don't stop. You kind of realize, you kind of look around and you, you're like, I'm on the level playing field with, with people in Ari's cubicle and with Ari. And it's like, uh, you surround yourself with all these intelligent people. And it's like, you're looking around and you're going, well, now what? what's my next step? Like, where can I go to continue educating myself and learning and bettering myself personally and professionally? And I think what you had said is just spot on. And it's just like, you just take these steps and you just keep growing and looking forward because you realize once you accomplish these things, they, they don't really mean a whole lot. They do when you're working on them, but when you actually get there, it's, it's different. And I'm sure you can speak to that as well. Yeah, definitely. The, uh, every one of those accolades or those experiences are sort of what I consider to be milestones or, or goals that I had in my career. Once you get there, like it feels great in that moment. Uh, and then it may feel great like the second time, and then it starts to diminish a little bit. And you don't necessarily lose, at least I have not lost sight of the privilege or the um, impact of being able to be have the honor to have those experiences, but you realize that they don't hold as much weight as you thought they did. And where the real weight is held is in the process of what it was that you created and how amazing that experience is. Uh, and not like when you hear the song on the radio or when you when the artist that you're working with wins the award or uh, the the song gets you know charts or gets a million streams or you know whatever those those milestones might be. Um, it's when you look back at that experience of being in the room and creating it and that cool moment that happened. Uh, or that like funny mistake that turned into this like cool part in the song or the way that the artist reacted when they heard the final master for the first time and like their vision finally came to life and you see their goosebumps or they're crying in the back of the control room. Like that's the stuff that like that fires me up now, now after recognizing that um, those, uh, you know, those things, the tangible things that we put so much weight on um, are not uh, permanent. They're only fleeting. Uh, and that, has a lot to do with my belief in uh, not just serving the artist's vision, but creating art that will outlast us. And that's a huge part of my mission uh, and the motto of the record shop. Mm, that's a, that's, that's really good as the, we're chasing the kind of the method and the process and not the actual goal. Because like you said earlier too, you could, what's your goal of, of uh, working with a, a songwriter, like pick a songwriter, any songwriter, the one you would love to work with. And you name them, and then the next, you know, in, in a year or two, you're working with that songwriter, and then you you write it, and you're like, okay, well, now what? I, I accomplished the, one of the biggest goals in my life. Well, now what do I do? And it's like, you've got to have, you just got to keep going and just like enjoy the process as you get to those goals. So as you're getting to those goals and you're working on those goals, uh, can you talk about div- diversifying your value uh, and why, what that means, uh, because you at the record shop do so many different, you have so many hats on, you're a producer, you're an engineer, you can be a songwriter at times, and you're a content creator. Like, why is it important to diversify your value as you're continuing to grow? Well, the, it makes me think of the, the quote that is often misquoted, where um, people say that you don't want to be a jack of all trades. 
But that original quote said something to the extent is that um, uh, you don't want to be a jack of all trades, but um, a jack of um, many is often better than one. And that was the entire quote. But it got taken and turned into uh, a negative thing. And uh, the way that I look at that is that uh, is kind of in a, in a middle ground. I don't necessarily want to be trying to do 100 million things. I want to have one purpose. And I know what my singular purpose is. It's to serve artists, create a vision, and create art that will outlast us. And I tell that to myself every morning. I tell that to myself in every challenging scenario that I'm in with an artist. I tell it to myself before every time I start a tracking session. Uh, I share it with my artists when I'm talking about considering working on their project and what my goals are for the projects that I'm involved in. And I use it as like a driving, motivating force to hold myself to a standard which will require me to be successful. And um, so with that, I look at how can I serve um, the, my, ar- the artists that I work with and the companies that I work with in, in the best way. And for me, diversifying value meant that I could be, the thing that I was going to master was producing records and engineering and just the overall orchestration of sound. Uh, but the things that I could diversify within would be thinking forward enough to say, hey, we're going to be doing this really cool choir session um, to do like the outro of the the big like climactic song of this record on Thursday. Maybe we should call a videographer to come in and film like the behind the scenes stuff so we can use it for socials, but then also you can use it for uh, maybe the music video or the um, any of like the promo stuff for the, you know, the record. Um, and, uh, by the way, I have somebody that would be really great that I could get over and, you know, and take care of that. Um, that's a great way for me to be able to diversify that value. Um, another way is in like right now in COVID where I couldn't bring artists in to finish vocals on records that we were almost done completing, but I did have a system that, that we had that I could drop off to their house and that we could record there. Um, so if I didn't have a a live recording, uh, side of our company, I wouldn't have that equipment sitting there to be able to uh, provide to them. And so that's how I've learned to diversify values by creating resources that are beyond just the recording, because I recognized early on in my career that the idea of a traditional recording studio was a very challenging model to exist and a nearly impossible model to start from the ground up if you only focused on the old school way of, you know, of doing that. So that was my approach to it. Um, for, uh, for like someone that may just be like a mixing engineer and like, that's all that they do. A great way for them to diversify their value would be to educate the clients that they work with on some of like the, the skills or maybe some of the plugins that they use or the way that they're creating sounds, um, and not being scared of like giving away their secrets, you know, because go on YouTube, like everybody knows all the secrets, but, uh, being able to share with the artists, the, uh, some, some ideas that will, uh, make them understand like the value of not just the quality of work that you're doing, but what they're going to learn from uh, that from from that experience of working with you and how that can be applied to the rest of their career. Now, in the case of an artist that's interested in like, okay, cool, like that's great for you as a producer, but how do I diversify what I do? I'm just a um, I'm just a singer, um, or I'm just a songwriter. Uh, well, we can look at what is the impact that you want your music to have on on the world. You know, a lot of artists um, say, well, I, I want to help. Um, I want to help people uh, within their experiences or help them, you know, cope with things. Um, well, that's great. So your music has the ability to do that. That's really powerful. Um, what other ways could you do that? Like as a human being, do you think that that you you could get involved with maybe a charitable organization that would support a mission that you're um, that you're excited about? Um, could you could you find a way to be able to um, be valuable to your fan base in a way just in a way like farther beyond um, you know your music? Um, uh, look at what uh, Lady Gaga did with the, that uh, amazing like c- collaboration of all kinds of artists. Um, uh, was that like a month ago or something? Um, to to uh, to give thanks to um, all of the frontline like medical workers and stuff. Um, and she like spearheaded this idea, or it seemed like that it was her spearheading this idea. Um, you know, to do that, that's not part of being Lady Gaga and, and, you know, being like the modern Madonna or this, like this, this amazing, unique, uh, you know, artist. Um, but look at some of the, like, she's an amazing example of how she's diversified, like her talent, um, uh, between being an activist and, um, and being a, you know, an influencer in, in ways and, uh, continuing to like rebrand and, and find new, new ideas for herself and then getting into acting and, you know, uh, 
So there's there's ways that artists can do that as well. But I think what it what it, that all stems from is like what your purpose is and what impact do you want to have on the world, and do some thinking about that. Like really dive into it. It took me a while to to figure that out. I learned about it kind of through my own experiences, and then just being aware of where I was ga- gaining fulfillment from. I found that one of the biggest ways that I got fulfilled when I was working with artists early on in my career was when they say when they would say to me this sounds exactly how I envisioned it. And that's where my idea came of serving the artist's artistic vision because enough people said that to me that eventually it just stuck in my head and I was like, this is what I love that I get so emotional and excited about when I'm working with an artist. So this is going to become part of my mission. Then second step to that is now I know what my mission is. Now how can I diversify the, the what I do or the impact of, of what I'm doing to be able to serve that mission in a larger way? And I don't think that it's much more compli- complicated than that. And then we, we, we learn how to, um, you know, diversify what we can, what we can add a value to, to people. Yeah, that's such good information. And it was, you know, so well, well said. And it, like you gave a perfect example of Lady Gaga and how she's becoming not just uh, the modern Madonna and musician, she is becoming an activist and a philanthropist through her work. And that's just becoming part of her brand and has been. Uh, and like her most recent event, like you mentioned, is is the prime example. And it's funny because this week's episode with Nate Stevenson on the show, we talked about the same thing as well. Is he works with artists and you know talks to them like, what do you want to do? Do you want to work with charities? Do you want to do this? Do you want to volunteer? And just kind of like building that into your brand and making it more about more about just the music and just kind of like personalizing it too about who you really are as a person, and then allowing that to spread through your music as well. Uh, and I, that's it's you gave great examples. Lady Gaga was perfect, and you know diversifying that was inc- incredible explanation. And I think that's a, a good place to wrap up. Uh, you mentioned you've got some some good some things to do in the studio this evening yet, uh, and I know it's a couple hours uh, ahead of me. Uh, but so, how can the listeners keep up with everything that you're doing in the record shop and all the the great artists that you're working with? Well, the biggest reason that I want to do things like this is to be able to support other people in in finding their fulfillment and make a living through their their passion. And I feel like one of the strongest ways I can do that is just being a resource for people. So I mean this uh, 100% authentically. The best way that you can uh, find out about what I'm doing is by emailing me at therecordshop1 at gmail.com. And you can find that information on my website also, therecordshopnashville.com. Click on the contact form. All of the messages at some point get sent to me. Uh, and if you're looking for help, for guidance, for support, um, no purchase required, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide a little bit of insight or some resources or some direction for people because I will never forget how challenging it was at 20 years old to move to a town like Nashville without knowing a single person and sitting in my uh, apartment staring at an empty inbox wondering why no one was responding and uh, and if, if someone puts forth the effort and that they're 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 really passionate about what they're doing, and they're, you're able to send me a clear message on how it is that I can help you. I will always respond. So that's the that that's where I start first and foremost. If you're interested in staying in touch with us and more of like a um, engaged like social basis, then all the social media platforms are great. Uh, Instagram at the Record Shop Studios um, is a great place to start, and I would love to hear about what people are doing. Um, and what challenges they're having. And if there's anything that I can do to help, I would love to help. If someone is really passionate about finding the intersection between art and business within their own uh, career, I have a course that I created with a partner. It's called mindmaptribe.com. Great. Great. And I'll put all of that information in the show notes below. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. You're the perfect guest for the show because you have such a wealth of information. You've worked with so many talented people and you've learned so much over the years. And and you, you were in a similar place as I was. You know, you kind of, you, you graduated from, or I graduated from school and you kind of realized like, well, what do I do now? And there's not, where do I go? And, and being able to lend a hand and offer your expertise and, and guidance is, is so important in this industry. And it, it, it changes the world uh, one email at a time, I guess you could say, or one comment on Instagram at a time. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate everything that you're doing in the industry and what you do for the artists and helping them uh, in create their vision uh, and a great connecting with you. So thank you so much for your time this evening uh, and for being such an incredible guest on the show. 
It's my absolute pleasure. And thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, this was great.